Mac Power Users, episode 557, Grading the Intel Era. Hello, everyone. This is David Sparks, joined by my fellow co-host, Mr. Stephen Hackett. How are you doing, Stephen? I'm good, David. It's good to be back. I was out last week. Thank you for holding down the MPU fort for both of us. Yeah, it was fun. And Liana and I could talk for hours, so that was an easy one. Uh, but we sure are glad to have you back. It's good to be back. And es- especially this week, because <laughs> we are tapping into your vast knowledge of Apple history this week. Um, I thought it'd be fun as we're heading into a new era of Apple microchips in their computers to take a look back at the last era. You know, And so today we're going to dive deep a bit on how the Mac ended up on Intel chips and how that went, and how it's ending in the near future. Yeah, I think I thought this would be fun. Uh, I, I'm also uh, psyched that you agreed to the idea. <laughs> it's like I really yeah. want to talk for an hour and a half about uh, processors. Like, yes, let's do it. So, yeah, yeah. A, l- a little bit different than uh, a normal episode, but it's not every day that the Mac makes a big transition. And those of us who follow the Mac and really care about it as a platform, this is big, important stuff. So we thought we could take a week and and talk about this here, you know, it could be very soon that we see the first Apple Silicon Mac. Apple said definitely by the end of 2020, and here we are in the middle of October, so it could be any time. Yeah, I mean, they they definitely going to have an iPhone announcement soon, and then the question is, are they going to say, oh, by the way, we also have the Silicon, new Apple Silicon Macs, or are they going to wait for another announcement for that? But but it's happening, and I do think that the history of Intel can really kind of give us a good idea of what to expect going forward. Yeah, absolutely. So let's let's kind of start there with the switch to Intel. So this this took place a lot longer ago than I thought it was. <laughs> Everything feels like it's 10 years ago. It was not 10 years ago. It was 15 years ago at WBDC 2005. Um, I've got a bunch of links in the show notes to this stuff. As we talk, you can go find other resources. This is the same keynote that podcasts were added to iTunes, which is wild. (laughs) It's the same one. I kind of like that, though. It kind of feels nice for this episode. Well, I I feel like back then, just in hindsight, Apple was moving a lot faster because they're a bigger company now and bigger companies move slower. But they they were doing crazy stuff like every announcement. Mm-hmm. And and this is right in the heyday of iTunes and iPod stuff. Every time Apple got on stage, not just at WWDC, but they had music events and they had Macworld still, iTunes and iPod announcements were always part of the story. And anytime you are thinking about announcements in this time or rewatching old videos, it's just ever present because it was a, a huge deal for Apple and it's really what got them to the size they were before the iPhone launch. And then, of course, from then to now, it's just been a, a drastic, drastic change. But the iPod and iTunes, they were really important in the in this sort of, you know, really from like 2003, you know, a couple years in to maybe 2008 or nine when it finally sort of started to fade to and gave up ground to the iPhone. iPod and iTunes, just like, we're on stage, we're going to talk about this stuff. Yeah, I went back and watched the keynote and... First of all, I just forgot how comfortable Steve Jobs was as a presenter. You know? Yeah, he's just so. I, I mean, the thing that made him good was he was just so comfortable, and it, it, it looked like he was just having a conversation with you. As anybody who does public speaking can learn a lot from that. But what I thought was interesting was the parody between the things he was saying then and the things Apple said a few months ago as they announced the Apple Silicon transition. Definitely a lot of echoes of this event at WBDC 2020 down to even some of the same language. And as we move into the technology side of it, a lot of the tech is being reused or new tech is reusing old names. At least Um, this is something that Apple definitely leaned on. I think this time around, and this even wasn't Apple's first processor switch. They went from the 68 K series to the power PC series and uh, we're not really getting into that today. That was a, a relatively rough transition in places. Basically, a lot of the system software had to be emulated for a while. Like Apple's hardware is moving faster than its software then, but they 
finally got their act together. Uh, but at this point in 2005, the PowerPC train had basically just run out of steam. And it's it's no it was no mystery as to why they wanted to do this. This had actually been rumored for a little while, not as heavily rumored as the Apple Silicon stuff, I think, but the Apple Silicon stuff is also a lot more obvious than this, which Intel was because like Apple's (laughs) designing their own chips. Like, of course they want to use them for everything. Yeah. I mean, they were already making Apple Silicon in all their mobile devices and people could already benchmark them against Mac. Yeah. So So just slap that thing in a MacBook air and call it a day, you know? Uh, yeah. I'm sure it's harder than that. I don't mean to belittle the work going into it, but, you know, just slap it in there and, and move on. Uh, there's a great uh, section in here where Jobs is like, why do we want to do this? You know, why would we do another transition? They had moved from 68K to PowerPC, but at 2005, really the move from OS 9, you know, classic Mac OS to Mac OS 10, really that was still kind of wrapping up. I mean, 2005 is only four years into this. They're on Mac OS 10 Tiger 10.4. There were still a lot of people either running on classic Mac OS still or dual booting or at least using the classic mode, which lets you run those old apps in an environment inside Mac OS 10. A spotlight was still running like a hamster wheel oh, was driving it. Oh yeah, spotlight and Tiger in those early days is not good. Um, very yeah. slow. But this is kind of the backdrop, right? The the seas really hadn't calmed from that that those previous storms. And like, hey, we're going to do this because we want to make the best computers for our users. And to do that, we've got to make this change. And that was the, according to this keynote, the driving force. We can't make what we want to make. We can't give you what you want without undergoing yet another transition. Yeah. And... um it was i think it was more needed then than it's needed now yeah. although there are some shadows of those same problems that we're facing today and we're going to talk later in the show kind of bringing this to the present but but it was uh it wasn't as obvious that it was going to happen but it was more needed i would say you know yeah i mean jobs had a had an issue on his hand where in 2003 they announced the power mac g5 and on stage, he says, hey, we're going to be at three gigahertz. And they weren't able to hit that number. And in the inner leaving time, I think in 2004, Jobs on, on this stage was like, hey, you know, the whole industry hit a wall. We haven't been able to go faster. We have heat issues. We're working on it. We're going to get there. But they they broke their promise of a three gigahertz Power Mac G5. But more importantly... The PowerBooks were stuck on older G4 processors. There would never be a PowerBook G5 because they couldn't shoehorn the G5 processor, which was incredibly power hungry and ran incredibly hot. They couldn't get that into a notebook. And I really think that was the machine that sort of sealed the deal for the PowerPC and the Mac that they couldn't upgrade the PowerBooks anymore. And in 2020... Right. I mean, it's like something like 80 or 85 percent, if not more, Mac sold or notebooks. 2005, that wasn't the case, but it was quickly becoming a notebook first world. And the power books are going to be left out of that if they couldn't move forward. And I think it says a lot that the we'll get into this, that the MacBook Pro was one of the first Intel machines announced because they really had a problem with this processor in these thin form factors. I can't help but feel like there's also another wrinkle to this story. You know, historically, Apple was an underdog company. And I think Steve Jobs and the people around him kind of reveled in that. And if you look at, you know, the first time Steve was at Apple, the idea of him going to a company like Intel and, you know, throwing their hat in with the big boys I think there would have been some resistance to that. And I know that Intel was an early investor in Apple. You don't need to write me and all that. But but just, you know, kind of tying the the flagship product to that big company, I feel like there was some resistance to that initially. Yeah. But I, I think this is also kind of an ex- example of how the second time Steve Jobs comes back and, you know, they're a bit more mature and they realize, no, we just we just need to go with the big boy. We need the biggest company on the block to make chips. So we don't have to deal with these problems anymore. I think you're right. And this is not that long after Apple was running ads 
mocking Intel because the the Power PC, even though it ran at slower clock speeds, it was faster to do a lot of under the hood engineering that I only marginally understand. In Apple, <laughs> at one point, like burned the Intel bunny suit character, like set them on fire, and it's it all this stuff, right? And yeah, some of that's like over the top marketing, but there's always a, a kernel of truth there. And I think you're right that Apple not only they didn't want to put their eggs in Intel's basket from like a philosophical standpoint, but there was real concern among the Mac faithful that, well, is this just mean the Mac is like a fancy PC, right? Is it going to feel like a PC? And that was all really overblown because the heart of the Mac is Mac OS. I don't really care what the processor is as long as it can run the Mac apps that I want. That's the, that's what I care about. But I think there was a little bit of that too, of like, well, we've been different because we, we've had these chips and they have real advantages and they did have real advantages for a really long time. But ultimately, uh, IBM, who who made the PowerPC processor, just couldn't get the, the heat output and the power consumption down low enough for Apple to build what it needed to build. I mean, look, there was a liquid cooled Power Mac G5. Do you think Apple wanted to do that? No way. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've got one, right? It's it's super heavy and they leaked and it was like a whole big deal. Apple didn't want to make that, right? But they had to because the G5 was so inefficient in these in these terms. Uh the way Apple says it in this keynote is performance per watt, which is like in one way it's kind of like a Bezos number, like it's just kind of a it's not really a thing, but it was useful to demonstrate to people for every watt of power we put into this chip, we get this much performance out of it. And if we switch processor families, you see this number get way better, right? So it is a useful metric. It's just one that's kind of wishy-washy, but I think it got the point across. And I think when Jobs like, look, a lot of you want a G5 in your power book. We haven't been able to do that. I think the people in the audience got it. And I think the greater Mac community as this news trickled out, because in 2005, you know, this wasn't being live tweeted by 6,000 people, right? As the news was known, I think people kind of latched onto that. of like, yeah, okay, I can see that Apple wants to go someplace. They want to ship products and they're being hamstrung by the PowerPC. And and my thought was, do I still get Finder? Do I still get my favorite apps from my tiny little developer friends? Mm -hmm. And once you realize that, you're like, okay, let's do this. Yep. The Apple uh, purchasers and consumers have, over the years, shown their ability to move with stuff like this pretty easily. Yeah. And I think Jobs put some of those fears at rest. He showed this great trick, which they repeated at WWDC this year, of, hey, the computer I've been demoing software to you all morning uh it's an intel mac right he goes to yeah. about this mac it's like a pentium that didn't ever that particular processor never shipped in a mac but it's like look like we're ran iphoto and iMovie all this stuff this morning during the keynote uh, it's not even a g5 you know and i think that put people at ease i think it was a really smart trick in the keynote to say look not only is this real but it's so real that we've used it all morning in front of all of you And I think that was a really smart move. And I think that's why Apple did it again this time of, oh, you know, that Big Sur demo you saw an hour earlier in the keynote. Ah, that was uh, Apple Silicon Mac. I mean, it's this is real and tangible. It's not a it's not a project on a whiteboard still. And I believe didn't they announce at the event that the MacBook Pro would be the first device that you could like even go buy it very shortly thereafter? Uh, it didn't make it until MacWorld the next year, but it was definitely rumored uh, even the following year, yeah. even here that the the PowerBook is going to be the first to go. Um, yeah, they they did lay out some software considerations. So they had a they were going to have an Intel version of Tiger. This is when they realize or when Apple says, "Oh, OS X has been compiled for Intel for years," which I think over time has been misconstrued. So OpenStep and NextStep, you know, the software that Mac OS X was born out of, that was compiled and ran as a product on Intel. So you could run OpenStep on a on an Intel PC just fine. What I have heard over the years uh, is that with the move to OS X, the rules are relaxed a little bit. It's not that they had, you know, Mac OS 10.2 Jaguar running on an HP 
PC somewhere, right? It's not that. It's that the code was meant to be cross-compiled and that nothing could be processor-specific. So it's not that just, hey, any moment they could just ship a DVD to somebody with an Intel version of OS X on it, but that the low-level stuff had been ready to go for a long time. So I think, you know, I think Jobs kind of glosses over some of that, but clearly this had always been in their back pocket as an escape valve of, hey, look, we need to be processor independent in case in case something happens. And I think that was a lesson learned not only from Apple's history of being stranded on the 68K and having to move to PowerPC, but also from Next history. They had issues in the beginning and they ended up, you know, making an Intel version of OpenStep and I think I think they had that kind of baked into their DNA that we always need to be on the lookout for if we need to jump ship, we have a a way to do that. And so OS 10 Tiger was ready to go. And Tiger shipped both as PowerPC and Intel versions. You could walk into an Apple store and buy either version uh, eventually. And they sort of ran parallel and then Leopard uh, reunified them where Leopard was a universal OS. But they were ready to go with the system software and they had a bunch of tools for developers, right? They had universal apps, which combined PowerPC and Intel code on one app in one application bundle. So you double click, you know, your copy of Dreamweaver. And if it's universal and you're on an Intel Mac, it loads the Intel code. And if it's universal and you're on a G5, it loads the PowerPC code. And that meant that you could go out and buy an application and say that you're on a G5 today, but you know you're going to buy an Intel Mac in two years, you know that Universal App will run for you in the future. It was a really important step. And for a long time, Mac websites and boxes in the Apple Store had that little Universal uh, graphic in the corner of the, you know, in the screenshot or on the box of the software saying, yes, this will run on, you know, your G4, your G5, your Intel Mac, whatever you have, don't worry about it. It's interesting, you know, that, kind of obsession with plan B, which really is a survival tactic for Apple yeah. that, that they had it when they were, you know, on power PC, they had it when they switched to Intel. I think they've been working on the idea of Apple Silicon for a while. And I think the new plan B for them is manufacturing capacity. You know, I think they're going to, you'll find in the coming years that they have a lot of different places they can get a series chips made. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're already seeing that in the iPhone being made in India. You know, they're they're spinning that up as we speak. So I think you're right about yeah. that. Uh, you also have Rosetta, which allowed PowerPC applications to run on Intel Macs. This was transparent to the user. So it wasn't like classic mode, right? Classic, if, if you remember, you started an OS 9 app and like you got a gray box and basically it was a classic Mac running kind of like a virtual machine on top of, Mac OS 10. This was not that. You could just click it in the dock and it would launch. It would run uh, fast enough that most people wouldn't notice. A lot of that was thanks to the gains of moving to Intel. The Intel chips were so much faster. It would cover up the yeah. emulation layer really easily. And this was important because things like Photoshop and Office, they weren't ready on day one. And a Mac that can't run Adobe software and can't run Microsoft software is not a useful Mac to a lot of people. And so this really was a bridge to the future that they they had to do. If you go back to early episodes of Mac Power Users, I was like brutal on Microsoft because this show started in, what, 2008? And it was still terrible. Yeah. You know, Microsoft Office took forever to kind of catch up with that. Hopefully they do a better job with the new Apple solution. Yeah. Well, I I think there's a reason that Microsoft and Adobe are always spoken about either by Apple and Keynotes or by us on the outside because they're so critical to so many people's workflows, right? And and speaking of Microsoft, another big advantage, while some Apple you know, faithful were worried that they were going to turn the Mac into a Windows PC, which they didn't, but they gave you the ability to turn the Mac into a Windows PC, which a lot of people really needed. And I remember at the time because, you know, being a lawyer, there's a bunch of Windows software that I need to get my job done. And for the first time, I'd be able to reliably run Windows software on a Mac was a huge benefit to me. And I think people lose track of that because now we've got kind of web-based applications, which are the new sexy. But back then, it was all about the platform. 
and there was Windows software and there was Mac software. There wasn't web software. Mm -hmm. And you really, if, if a developer decided not to make it for the Mac, then you just didn't have the ability to use it. And uh, the ability to run windows on the Mac was a huge deal. And I know a lot of like friends who were using uh, windows PCs begrudgingly who jumped into, you know, Mac with, with this announcement. Oh yeah, because you could just run Windows as a virtual machine, and you know, be in your Mac, and then the one app you need in Windows, you just have it there, uh, ready for you. And that's something that's going away with Apple Silicon, as we'll talk about. And I'm very curious to see how people react to that. I agree yeah. with you; it's less of a big deal now than it was 15 years ago. But yeah, but for some people, it's still a big deal. So yeah. I, um, but yeah, we can talk about that later. And once we actually get Silicon Max, that's another discussion. But I do think mm-hmm. people don't undervalue the the idea of running Windows on a Mac and how that was an, an immediate um, rich area of speculation and anticipation yeah. for a whole segment of Mac users and wannabe Mac users. In fact, before Apple shipped Time Machine, people were like hacking Intel iMacs to like figure out how to get it to boot Windows. And then Apple's like, okay, here you go. Here's Time Machine. Yeah. Or uh, I'm sorry, I mean, boot, boot Camp. Camp. Boot Camp. Yeah. Um, uh, real quick before we leave this keynote, uh, they did have a developer transition kit. I wrote about this on Mac Story, so the details are in there. But basically, it was a cheese grater case with a PC inside of it that could run Mac OS X Tiger for Intel. And it was hardware for developers to test their Intel software on because you couldn't emulate this on a PowerPC Mac. Or you had to have actual hardware. It was $1,000 to borrow one, and then you got to ship it back to Apple. Uh, I don't know. There... Uh, maybe one or two of these floating out in the world still from best I can tell. I don't have one. I would love to have one, but like I said, there's maybe one or two floating out there still uh, a weird computer, but like go read that article. If you're interested, it's, it was, it was fun to go through that, but just like now Apple ha- gave developers, not only the software tools and universal and Rosetta, but also hardware to make sure they were ready to go on day one, which is, it's good. I mean, Apple needs to give developers tools during these, these times. You know what I love is how every time that developer machine comes up on a podcast that Steven's on, mm-hmm. the way he says, well, there may be one out there. Man, I sure would like one. He's yeah. just, audience, fishing. he's begging you. I'm fishing. He's begging you. Yeah. If, if there's somebody out there that knows where one is, please call Steven. Yes. You, you would literally make his year. It's true. God, I'd love to have one of those. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, that's that. Uh, they they did that, and again, that's something that echoes into the present, which we can talk about in a little bit. This episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by 1Password. Go to onepassword.com slash MPU in all caps, and you get 20% off your family plan. Uh, 1Password is the application that Stephen and I use to track passwords and keep ourselves safe on the internet. It's just a great app because you only have to remember 1Password. You just type in the 1Password, it takes care of the rest for you. Uh, So every time you go to a new website, log in, it helps you create a new safe and secure password, then it puts it in for you. And it's got a whole bunch of other features, like the ability to monitor the websites that you use to make sure that if they get hacked, you get a warning, and then you can go in and protect yourself. And the family plan is great because it extends that protection to your entire family. We have the uh, one password family plan in the Sparks family. I pay for it. Don't think I'm just because they sponsor. I'm like hitting them up for free stuff. I use it. So I pay for it. Just got my bill. And it is so worth it because my wife and my kids both, they all have um, great, you know, password protection now. And we have this, these shared vaults that we can share passwords between us. My wife and I, like the other day, she needed to log into the medical insurance website. So I just put it in our shared vault and she had it. Uh, when we want to do the Netflix password and we change it, I put it into the shared family vault. I do not tell my kids what the new password is. I make them log into one password. So I'm giving them a way to uh, encouraging them to use good password habits. I think that's the way I would put it. But you get a whole bunch with this family plan. You get apps for the Mac, iOS, Windows, Android, Linux, and Chrome, um, unlimited passwords, items, and one gigabyte of document storage. Think about that. So if you've got your key documents, you know, your insurance, your, we're, a lot of us are thinking about fires here in California. So you take all that stuff that you absolutely need if your house burns down, 
You put it in your one gigabyte of one password storage. It's totally safe and secure and available to you anywhere. They've got 24 seven email support, 365 day item history to restore deleted passwords. They have travel mode. This is really brilliant. So when you cross borders, you can put your device into travel mode. So if authorities take your device, they can't get your passwords. There's two factor authentication for an extra layer of protection. And with those shared vaults, you can share passwords, credit cards, secure notes, and do it safely. Here's a power tip I use. Uh, my wife and I have a shared vault for the credit cards. And not only do I put the credit card information in, I also take pictures of the credit cards and share them in that one password vault. That way, if they get lost, we can read the little details in the back with the 1-800 number and all the other things we need to do. It's really useful. Um, and you can manage what family members can and can't see. And it's just a great way to teach your kids good password habits, which I think is a very important skill going forward because this stuff is just going to become more important. And, you know, it's just great. You can recover accounts for locked out family members. It's it's all, you know, very well thought out. There's a really smart group of people at the one password uh, company trying to think seriously about protecting your privacy. And I love having them at my back with one password for families. So go to onepassword.com slash MPU in all caps. They've got a nice little welcome screen there for you. They talk about the Mac power users because they love us. And we love them. Uh, you can sign up there, get 20% off your family plan and get started today. So what are you waiting for? Get real password protection for you and your family at onepassword.com slash MPU. So let's talk about some of the the early highlights when it comes to Intel Macs. And I think we got to start with the first two. Uh, this was at Macworld 2006, so six months after the announcement we just spoke about, which was a surprise to most people. You know, Apple said this is going to take a little while. I don't know if any of us really thought we would see one, let alone two Intel Macs just a few months later, but we did. Um, and the first one was the the Intel iMac. And this is something that I think we can learn something about moving forward, that the Intel iMac looked and had the exact same features as the iMac G5 with iSight that it replaced. That was like three months old. I wrote about that years and years ago. The iMac G5 with iSight was not out very long, uh, but it was basically the same machine, except it had this cool trick of being two to three times faster Thanks to the new processors. It's a good trick. Yeah. Yeah. And and that was an example of we're not going to re-engineer the hardware. We just want to get this new fast chip in what we have. Right. And so today, obviously, the iMac is due for a refresh. So I think maybe it will get a redesign with ARM. But I think a lot of the other Macs won't. I think they're going to just say, look, hey, uh, this MacBook Air is now twice as fast as it was yesterday and it has this new chip and, you know, go at it, consumer. Yeah, I think the MacBook Air is the poster child for this. Mm -hmm. It just got redesigned. Yeah. Like, what was it, a year and a half ago? Yeah. Uh, people like the redesign. There's no reason to start that over. Mm -hmm. If you can, you know, shoehorn an a, a Apple Silicon chip in there, they got the better keyboard. They, should, they could probably fit the Apple Silicon too, right? Oh, yeah. Um, I'd be shocked if that computer is massively different than the prior version, except for the Apple Silicon. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So I guess we'll wait for later. But the um, the, the MacBook Pro, there's two different MacBook Pros. So that's a whole other discussion, I guess. Let's save that one. Okay. So the there's a funny thing here where Apple calls these dual processors. And it's not really that the way we use the terminology today. They will They were dual core single processors. And Apple did this for a while. And after a year or so, it kind of fades from their language. I'm not really sure why they did this because it is a single processor with just more than one processor core. I don't think it's being misleading. I think maybe just our terminology has changed over time, but it meant that the iMac was dual core and it was two to three times faster. Now, that, that doesn't mean everything was, right? Like, it still had spinning hard drives and a DVD drive, right? So a lot of things were not two to three times faster, but things that just relied on CPU tasks could be that much quicker. And it was really amazing to me at the time that the prices even were the same. So they looked the same. They had the same screen sizes and everything, same features. 
but they they were able to keep the same price as well. And it was basically just a complete switch. And one day you you walked into the store and got an iMac G5, and the next day you could get a very fancy Intel iMac. And I'm sure people who bought you know the G5 with eyesight were maybe a little upset, but that that is how this goes. Like there's always going to be something new. But yeah, the iMac was sort of this very kind of under the radar update. And, you know, all of a sudden we have an Intel Mac just sitting there and it's not that different from before. Yeah. I think the reason they called it dual processors is because at the time that was a new thing, you know, dual core. Yeah. I'm not sure people understood what that meant. And, uh, you know, Apple is good at marketing. So, yeah, I think, I think you're right. Yeah. But eventually people figured it out. Mm-hmm. So that's fine. And actually, the interesting thing to me is at this point, I don't think even people care. I, I don't know how many cores there are in my iPad Pro as I sit here. Yeah. I, I've lost track. I think there are six, but I'm not even sure about that. So, you know, I, I think successfully they turned, you know, that that spec off in the public consciousness. Yeah. I think only people who are buying iMac or Mac Pros care about that. Yeah. Like, how many cores are there in your Mac Pro, Steven? Twelve. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't think that would take you long. I didn't think yeah, it would take you that no. long to answer that. <laughs> yeah, that was twelve. Um, and then we get a one more thing, like Jobs Classic line. And this is where uh, we get the the MacBook Pro. And the introduction yeah. is really, really funny. He's like, look, we've had trouble getting a G5 into the PowerBook. There's a line like we've, you know, we've talked to all higher authorities. There's like a picture of like an angel on the screen. It is is a pretty funny, you know, he's kind of poking fun at the situation Apple's in. And he says, hey, this is the second Intel Mac. We're giving it a new name. And the reason's really interesting. He says, it's a new name because we're kind of done with power. I think that was in the earlier days when they switched to PowerPC, they added power to the product names. Like we're kind of yeah. done with power. And we want Mac to be in the name of the products. Now, David, I want to know if you remember, what did you think about this name? Because a lot of people did not like it. No, I thought it was fine. I, I, I did not have that. You know, it was, that's such an Apple thing. Everybody goes crazy over the name, but you know, it's a, yeah. it was a powerful Mac. I, what I remember about it was after the announcement, so many friends racing to order one. I had in my mind, the vision of, I forget what movie it was where, there's big news and all the reporters run into the the phone booth so fast that they knock them all over. That mm-hmm. that was my impression. <laughs> I wasn't worried about the name. How about you? Yeah, I didn't really mind the name. I thought it was awkward, but just like any other product name, we just have gotten used to it and we don't even think about it anymore at all. <laughs> right? Yeah. It is what it is. And people were going crazy about iPad. Sure. Nobody cares now. No. You know, just like uh, pick an Apple product and there was people unhappy with the yeah. name. I don't know. iPhone 11 Pro Max is still bad. I'll stand yeah. by that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I don't think they're going to get off that train. No, no there's going to be more of those. Um, because they were coming from the G4, it was three to four times faster because they, they skipped over the G5, which was the whole point of this machine. But unlike the iMac, this was tweaked from the PowerBooks from the 15 inch power book. It had the MagSafe connector, which I could just talk all day about how wonderful it was. Uh, one time we were doing an event and it may have been, a, I know what it was. It was a, the Mac power users meetup in Chicago. You and Katie put it on and I flew up for the day. Do you remember this? And yeah, I yeah. had a conversation with Dr. Drang for like 30 minutes about how great MagSafe was and like how, you know, Apple had worked so hard, like balance the strength of it versus, you know, you need to be able to pull the cable off. And it was, of course, very fascinating because Dr. Drang knows how things work and I don't. So um always think about him when we talk about MagSafe. Well, I mean, just the amount of force required to pull it off in the emergency, but not so, you know, but enough that it stays attached for when it can, you know, it doesn't just fall off. Right. And, uh, it's like it knew if it was an emergency or not. I mean, it was, yeah. it was great. Uh, it got a huge applause when it was announced that it had the eyesight camera built in. That was obviously that was a really big deal because the PowerBooks didn't have that. And then it had the IR remote with with front row, which was uh, this media interface Apple had for a while that kind of was like Apple TV but on the Mac. Can I can I interrupt for one second though on the MagSafe question? Sure. Have you have you ever tried any of these current aftermarket USB C 
you know, MagSafe adapters? Uh, I have not. And and maybe this is foolish, but I, mm, I feel like they're a little sketchy, all of them. Like, I, I just, I don't know. Uh, I don't like that USB-C doesn't break away, but I haven't tried any of these. Uh, yeah, I bought one when they first started making them, and it seemed fine. And the way it works is it plugs a USB-C plug into your Mac, and then that's basically a housing where there's kind of a, a copy of a MagSafe that attaches to another USB-C cable. And it works, but the problem is, is there's this nib sticking off the side of your computer. Yeah. And you've got to constantly worry that you're going to bang that against something and like damage the USB-C port. Yeah. And uh, so ultimately, I just stopped using it. And uh, and I haven't missed it that much. But yeah, boy, USB-C was a thing, wasn't mm-hmm. it? A, a guy at my college newspaper got one of these first-generation MacBook Pros. And I had a PowerBook at the time. And it was amazing how much faster it was. I would bring my PowerBook in to render big graphics because we were using like Quicksilver G4 towers, like at 867 megahertz. And so my PowerBook was faster than the tower. But then this guy got a MacBook Pro and even smoked my PowerBook in doing graphics work. So that, that made me sad yeah. for my for my PowerBook. And they did sell them alongside the PowerBook for a little while because this was only the 15-inch. And over time... The 12 inch would be replaced with the MacBook, which we'll talk about in a second. And the, eventually the 17 inch MacBook Pro came out. So this was a transition even within this one product. But yeah, way faster. And I think the MacBook Pro, like, it, I think it had to go first, you know, in this first round because it really was the problem child in the PowerPC days. I, there are two Macs in my life that I have lusted over as hard as you are lusting over one of those transition Macs that we talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. It, it was the Mac SE 30. Mm-hmm. I wanted one of those so badly, I did not have the money for it. And the same thing when the the first MacBook Pro came out, because everybody that could afford one that was in our little circle got one. Yeah. And they all loved them, and they literally ran circles around our older Macs. Yeah, yeah. Way, I mean, way <laughs> faster. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know if we're going to get that big of an increase because just of the circumstances, but I guess we'll see in a couple months. Yeah. I have that question too. I really don't know. The next big hit or the next uh, step along the road was the 13 inch MacBook. It replaced three computers, the 12 inch power book, the 12 inch iBook and the 14 inch iBook. It was introduced by press release in May of 2006. And this this MacBook, so it's the white plastic and the black plastic MacBook, was a a huge hit. I, I would I don't know this for sure, but I would I would not be surprised that in, until it went away that it was the most popular Mac model ever sold. They were absolutely everywhere. I was in college during this time, and dude, it seemed like overnight. Like we went away for summer break, and we came back in the fall of '06. And every single person in all of my classes had a white plastic MacBook. They were ubiquitous overnight. And the price was good. It had a really nice mix of features. I think people really liked the 13-inch widescreen because it was it was bigger than the 12-inch and higher resolution than the 14. It was a solid machine. It, yeah, they had some problems, but it was the Intel Mac for the masses. And I, I just I don't know if the iBook G4 ever really enjoyed that success. Yeah, I I don't know that there ever was a Mac that was as ubiquitous as the white slash yellow MacBook. Yeah, <laughs> then the, increasingly the yellow and the cracked. MacBook Air. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the cracks. I forgot about the cracks right oh, under gosh. the keyboard. Man, I could replace the top case on one of those real easily. I bet. So that you were st- were you working at Apple when those were getting replaced? Yeah, I started an Apple at Apple Christmas two thousand and six. And so they were definitely around. And then when I was working on the outside, but for Apple's customers, schools had MacBooks, right? So we'd go into a school and replace 35 top cases in a day because they were all cracked and splintering. (laughs) But, um, But the MacBook proved to be extremely popular. And I think that, I don't think switching to Intel had that much to do with it. I think it was more the form factor and the features and the price. But the fact that it was an Intel Mac just helped it, that people could run windows that they needed to like if you need to run like microsoft access or something that wasn't on the mac at the time you could do this and it was just 
again, other than the physical issue with the case, it was a solid little computer and, and it was easily upgradable, which was nice too. You could just pop the battery out and put a bigger drive or a more RAM in. It was, it was really well put together. Yeah. I, I did so many upgrades on those for family members for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> But the uh, I would argue that the Intel transition really was what made that whole kind of revolution possible because they just didn't have the processing power until they went over to Intel. It wasn't just the ability to run Windows. It was just the ability to have a modern chip in there and keep up with the competition because as nice as that machine was, if it was dog slow, people would not have bought it. Yeah, you're right. So a, a year after the announcement at WDC 2006, actually like 13 months later, the the transition was done. Apple had an Intel XServe and then the Intel version of the G5 Tower, renamed the Mac Pro. And this was quad processors. It was two dual core chips in every model. Previously, that was only the high-end model. And Apple finally hit the three gigahertz mark. Now, it wasn't the base Mac Pro, the, the high end SKU uh, was at three gigahertz, and, and then it was the 64 bit Xeon processors, which we hadn't seen in the Mac line to date. And it was Apple, I think, really showing look what we can do when we get rid of the G5. There was more storage, there was a second optical drive slot, more PCI slots, because you didn't need all this space to cool the G5s. The Xeons ran so much cooler and were so much more energy efficient. It let Apple totally remix the inside of that case. And I mean, the Mac Pro to this day is still on Xeon parts and is still sort of the high end of the line. And this started here. And it was remarkable how fast Apple did it, right? 13 months and they're done. And they said it was going to take, you know, two years, like they've said this time. So it all went very smoothly. And then the uh, then the the Mac Pro was sort of the the cap at the end of the transition. Yeah, but at the same time, the MacBook Pro was evolving very quickly as well. I mean, we got the Battleship, the 17-inch one. Mm-hmm. You know, Apple hardware has been on a roll for a long time. And I would almost argue it really started with this Intel transition. They crushed it, and they just continue to stay ahead of the software team to this day. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, they, they really had... Uh, a lot of of smooth sailing. And I think what's interesting is uh, really in 2008, so a couple years into this, so we had we had regular revision in 2006, 2007, 2008. They moved from Core Duo to Core 2 Duo. And then at, at Macworld 08, we see the first MacBook Air. And yeah. I talk about this because it is, I really think, something that Apple had wanted to build for a long time, and it wasn't possible with the PowerPC. In fact, if you go watch this keynote, they talk at length about how this is you know, only possible because we work so closely with Intel. It was a full Core 2 Duo, but it was on a smaller, smaller package, and how they were able to have engineers work together in this deep collaboration, right? And and that's what Apple wanted. That's what they didn't have with IBM and the PowerPC. And the the machine that was birthed of that was the MacBook Air. Now, it was pretty slow and it had weird ports and it didn't have a lot of features people wanted at the time, but it was really the future of laptops. And even though the first example of it wasn't spectacular, it definitely paved the way to what we have today. And it came from the move to Intel. This wouldn't have been possible before. I, I remember a lot of like people outside of the Apple ecosystem at the time asking me about this computer. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was like a news item. And Apple had a great commercial at the time. I forget the name of the artist. They had a song. And it just, I mean, nobody had ever seen a computer like this before. It was, man, that was one of the sexiest Macs ever made. And I know in history, you know, looking back, it, it maybe wasn't ready for prime time yeah. when they did that. But but you saw the payoff a year or two later with the, the second generation MacBook Air. But, but man, that computer got people's attention. Yeah, it, it was amazingly thin and light. Now to do that, they, they lobbed out the optical drive. I have a link on the show notes to my favorite, maybe my favorite keynote slide of all time. 
which is just a picture of an optical disc and the word why underneath it. That <laughs> just that always cracks me up, you know, because at this point they had Time Machine and Time Capsule and the iTunes Store and the iPods. You didn't need optical media, um, Apple said. But they did have to use an iPod hard drive. You said it, it was maybe a little before its time. An SSD would have solved a lot of this computer's problems, but you could get an SSD in it, but it was like a thousand dollars. Yeah, it was expensive for sixty-four it gigabytes. Like a, it's like a sixty gigabyte, wasn't it? What <laughs> yeah, was it? yeah. Uh, so they put iPod hard drives in them, and I I used one of these for a little while. Uh, we had one come into the company I was at, and I kind of scooped it up to evaluate it. And holy moly, it was slow, but it pointed the way to the future. And we'll talk about that here in a minute, but. Really, the collaboration of Intel and Apple is what made it possible, and that's why I included it here on a sort of our tour of early Intel Macs, because this was not a machine that would have come into the world had they not switched. This episode of Mac Power Users is brought to you by Text Expander from our friends over at Smile. Visit textexpander.com slash podcast to learn more and get 20% off your first year. Think about things that you type Over and over. For me, it's things like email addresses, uh, my physical address, my P.O. box, things that I always mistype or or spell incorrectly, snippets of code. I could look, I could type all of those repeatedly throughout my work week, but it would be taking away a lot of time from other tasks. And with Text Expander, I'm able to take all that time back. And you've worked with a team that is only more true. So the latest version of Text Expander has new and improved stat reporting for organizations. It includes the ability to build reports complete with customizable date ranges, both for enterprises and individuals. So you can see how much time your sales team is saving or how much time your support group is saving by using Text Expander. A text expander can keep your whole team consistent, accurate, and current. So if you have shared language among different staff members, you can update it and know everyone is on the same page. You can share text and images with the whole staff to keep them on track. You can work faster and smarter because text expander's powerful shortcuts and abbreviations streamline and speed up everything you type. I don't know the last time I typed a full date on my computer because for me, semicolon DD gives me the date. And I don't have to sit there and wonder how I spell September or October or November. It text expander knows and does it for me. So keep your whole team communicating efficiently with consistent language, share your snippets of messaging, signatures, and descriptions with everyone who works on projects with you. It really is a fantastic way to keep everyone aligned. Text expander is available on the Mac, Windows, Chrome, iPhone, and iPad. Show listeners get 20% off their first year by visiting textexpander.com slash podcast to learn more. Our thanks to Text Expander from Smile for their support of MPU. All right, so the next section of the outline, Stephen has appropriately named Smooth Sailing. And in my head, looking through all these Macs that got released in the next phase of the Intel relationship, it's like if this were a 1980s romantic comedy there'd be a montage song right now. (laughs) There'd be like an upbeat song and they'd be like going to the park on the swing together, maybe out in the water. Maybe he accidentally gets splashed in the water. Everybody's laughing. Ha ha ha. It was a great time for the Intel and the Mac. It is. Uh, You mentioned the, the first example here, but the revised MacBook Airs that came out in the fall of 2020, the 11.6 and the 13.3 inch. 2010, you mean? 2010. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, they were fantastic, right? They took the mantle from the 13-inch MacBook, became the default Mac, thin, fast, light. And I mean, talk about machines that we lusted after. I was a MacBook Pro user during this time and I wanted a MacBook Air, right? And I was happy with my MacBook Pro. I wanted the power and the bigger screen, but I looked at those Airs, it's like, man, this seems really awesome and they were really awesome yeah i never owned one of the 11 inch ones but man was that a computer i wanted i i think you could make an argument that the macbook air that came out in 2010 was the best mac ever i mean i think there's a good argument you could make for that yeah i can get behind that i mean it it brought ssd storage to the masses 
thin and light, still pretty powerful. Now, the early ones were a little light on RAM, but, you know, 2013, 2014, the later ones in particular were really pretty, you could make them pretty powerful. And it had a bunch of I.O. people wanted, like a USB and SD card slot on the bigger one. Yeah, it was, it was, they were fantastic machines. You know, the idea of the computer being a toaster, you know, just being a tool you use. The MacBook Air was priced right. It, it had the power to do most things for most people. And, I mean, to this day, I know people that just loved their MacBook Airs. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's about the same time that the story circulated about Steve Jobs going into a room full of hardware engineers with the iPad and the MacBook Air. And he turned the iPad off and on. He said, see, look, it's off. Now it's on. It's off. Now it's on. Then he looked at the MacBook Air and said, make that do this and walks out of the room. And I feel like this was kind of the response to that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the same. It's still not as immediate as as an iPad, but... Before this, booting up a computer was a process, which it just isn't anymore. And I think this was kind of the start of that. Yeah. Yeah. This MacBook Air, uh, I think the line was, it's like a MacBook and an iPad hooked up. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But that's not the only thing that came out in our montage, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the the next bit of the montage is the, the Retina MacBook Pro. And this was in 2012. It was introduced at the high end of the MacBook Pro line, but again, thin and light and powerful quad core i7. I bring this up because it it also shows that Apple was willing to add things to Intel machines. So it had NVIDIA graphics, which Apple used for a long time. Now they use AMD graphics because Apple and NVIDIA broke up, which is awkward. But the Retina MacBook Pro, again, one of those machines is like lustworthy and it being really powerful with that quad core i7, it was a workstation machine with a beautiful display that you could put in your backpack. And boy, yeah. the, another machine that is like, whoo, I it would have been so awesome to have that first one. I don't think I, I think I did get the first one. I mean, that's the one I couldn't resist. I mean, the retina screen, and how could you resist that? Yeah. It was really fantastic. Yeah. Really fantastic. And and again, built around SSD as well. You know, that really was a big breakthrough kind of in this time as well. Intel doesn't deserve all the credit for that, but definitely something that was in the mix in a lot of these machines too. Yeah. Yeah. And then in 2013, the MacBook Air got even better. It did. So this this was the Haswell generation of Intel Core 2 Duo chips. And The big deal with Haswell was much better battery life. And so these were dual core CPUs and Apple's claims was that the 13 inch MacBook Air got 12 hours of battery life and nine hours on the 11 inch, which was way up. It was up from seven and five respectively. Uh, I did have one of these machines. I changed jobs in 2013 and this was the machine that I got and it's like you couldn't kill it. I mean, the battery life really was incredible. And Apple did stuff in Mac OS Mavericks to, to take even better advantage of it and to really make low power sleep and line up all the apps so they hit the processor at the same time so they could keep the battery life good. Uh, but it really was fantastic. And really, when I think about this MacBook Air style, the 2013 in my mind is the high point because of this battery life jump. Uh, and the graphics were better too. Apple, you know, Apple was using integrated graphics from Intel, and they also got a big jump with Haswell, which was which is much welcomed. The other machine I want to talk about in this section is uh, returning to the Mac Pro, because at the high end, Apple Intel continued to really push things with that core count. You know, you said it earlier, multiple cores was a new thing, especially to Mac users. By 2010, there was an 8-core Mac Pro, and by 2012, there was a 12-core Mac Pro. And so while the MacBook Air is like this thin, light little notebook with 12 hours of battery life, if you needed all the Mac power you could buy, then the Mac Pro was there too. It was a really nice range of of power with the Mac Pro way there up at the top for people who needed it. Yeah, and th- you know this really kind of explains the angst of the last few years for Mac owners. Because Apple really kind of had the whole product line figured out for a while there. 
They did. There really weren't many gaps in the line in this time frame. You know, there are always things to complain about. Like maybe the Mac Pro should be updated more often, or okay, the iMac maybe went a little bit longer than it should have. There's always something. But I felt like the curve through the line of power and price was pretty good in this time frame. And you could squabble about details, but overall there was a Mac for everybody. And that wasn't the case much of the past five years, really. Yeah. Uh, and that's a bummer. What now what about input output? Because you know, the switch to to Intel also facilitated, you know, the uh, the ports. Yeah. So they started out with FireWire 800. They brought that over, but uh, Thunderbolt started replacing that in 2010, 2011, sometime in there, much faster and much more versatile because from Thunderbolt, you could get out to video out or data, Ethernet, FireWire, or straight Thunderbolt. And it's walked from Thunderbolt 1 at 10 gigabits per second to Thunderbolt 2 at 20. They use the same connector. The Thunderbolt 3 we have now at 30 gigabits per second. So again, at the high end, making Max work with accessories in a much faster, more powerful way is, is good. Now on the low end, I'm not sure how people really cared when their I'm or when their MacBook Air moved from mini display port to Thunderbolt, except maybe you could, you know, get out to other things. But it was a big deal for pro users, and that came with Intel. Now, now it's a little bit different. Intel now licensed Thunderbolt. I think that we will see uh, something on the ARM Max that is comparable to this, whether it be Thunderbolt or USB 4, which sort of merges USB and Thunderbolt a little bit in some weird ways. But at the time, this was a, a direct result of their relationship with Intel. Had they stayed on the PowerPC, we would not have seen Thunderbolt, you know, in 2012 <laughs> on a yeah. on an iMac or whatever. So but it also made the Thunderbolt display possible, which is one of my favorite accessories of all time. I just, I'm a huge Thunderbolt display fan because it was the dream of you have a couple of cables and your laptop becomes a desktop. Like so many people still chase that today. Yeah. You know, I, I hadn't, I've never talked to you about the Thunderbolt display, but yeah, I, I can see why that, that makes so much sense to you. Yeah. When I first quit my job, I had a 15 inch MacBook Pro and I had a Thunderbolt display at home. And then the little office I was like sub renting from my, my brother's nonprofit. We were, uh, we were there together and I had a Thunderbolt dock so, so I could have my MacBook Pro with, you know, hard drives and a big display and everything. And, and you can still do that today with Thunderbolt three, but what was cool about the Thunderbolt display is it had Thunderbolt out, but also had USB it had audio and it had ethernet out. So you re it really could turn your notebook into a desktop more or less. And now with the LG displays or the XDR, even it's really just, okay, it's more USB-C or Thunderbolt ports out the back. It's not this great collection of ports anymore. And I kind of wish Apple had done something a little bit more like this, or if they do end up with their own 5k display again and, and not rely on LG, I would hope that we would see this sort of thing where we have even more IO on the back of the display. You know, then it was Thunderbolt and MagSafe, and now you could just do it with one with one cable, which would be cool too. Yeah, I mean, I, I had one as well in my office, and I, I had a MacBook Pro that could run Windows and Mac, and I'd just come in in the morning, plug it in, and I wouldn't use it as a laptop for the rest of the day. And it was great. And that display really made it possible. And this is another thing where Apple had a solution, an affordable solution, that they don't anymore. Yep. It's a bummer. Yeah. I don't know. I, part of me feels like that's going to get solved. I, I just feel like that's like in, that's got to be in the pipeline. Do they really want to not sell a monitor that has an Apple logo on the bottom? I mean, they... It, for less than six thousand dollars. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. Yeah, you know, for the yeah, for the course. normal people. Yeah, yeah. This episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by Hover. Go to hover.com/mpu and make a name for yourself and get ten percent off any domain. I am so happy to have Hover as a sponsor of the Mac Power Users. They have been a sponsor of this show going back many years, and I am a customer. 
When you have that one big idea, where do you go? Well, your business starts with a domain name. So for many entrepreneurs, Hover is that big leap. It was for me. Hover has over 300 domain name extensions to choose from. No matter what you want to build, there's a domain name waiting for it. And they have excellent technical support to answer any questions you may have. And they've got a dedicated team to help you getting online and not upselling you. Maybe you need a URL for your new company. Maybe you need a URL for your new company. Why not start as you mean to go on and choose a .inc domain or show people you're serious about your business? Hover has free who is privacy so the bad guys don't get your information, a clean user interface, and monthly sales on popular top-level domains. It's easy to see why Hover is a popular choice for people starting business. Now, when I decided, actually before I decided to leave my my job and start my own practice, I started, you know, kicking the idea around in my head and one of the things I did was go on Hover and buy the domain sparksesq.com. And it felt so liberating owning that, even though I didn't use it for years afterwards. But, you know, getting that domain was for me the first step. And I'm I'm a dedicated Hover customer. Not only do I have uh, Sparks ESQ there, Max Sparky is also at Hover. And also I pay Hover to manage my email for me. My IMAP email runs through Hover. They do all of that stuff for me. And they've just been a great, service provider to me. We know you like intuitive user experiences and things that work straight out of the box, so I know you'll love and appreciate Hover. Their user interface is really simple, clean, and easy to navigate. They are not playing a game with you. They're not trying to trick you into buying things you don't need. When you go to use Hover, it's very easy to work your way through the process and get exactly what you want. Buy your domain and start using it today. Go to hover.com slash MPU and get a 10% discount on all new purchases. That's hover.com slash MPU. Make a name for yourself with Hover. Our thanks to Hover for their support of this show and all of Relay FM. So let's talk a little bit about when the the wheels started coming off the bus. Yeah, or, so the song ended. The, yes. the romantic comedy is no, no longer romantic the, or comedy. The montage ended because the robots started to sink. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the the first problem and really the machine that I in my mind is sort of the current power book in the sense that okay this didn't do what they wanted it to do is the the one port MacBook which has actually been discontinued now. I think Apple wanted to relive the magic of the first MacBook Air and it has a lot of similarities, tiny computer, tiny logic board, less IO than people maybe were used to. But to do it, Apple you had to turn to the Intel Core M processor. And initially that topped out at a whopping 1.3 gigahertz. This didn't have a fan, which is cool. The Core M is just uh, a five watt CPU, so you didn't have to cool it actively. But it didn't pan out. They were really slow, even with an SSD. And Apple did update it twice, both in 2016 and 2017. And by the end, it was a lot faster. But the iPad obviously would just blow it away. Now, what I want to kind of put up here is that some of this is on Apple, right? There, It was their design that required the CPU. But if Intel had better options in this class of processor, the MacBook wouldn't have been such a stinky computer. And so, you know, I think as we move forward and even talking about the stuff we've spoken about the last hour, there's always that balance of what Apple wants to build and what they want to do and what their technology partners have available to them to meet those goals. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, earlier I talked about how what made the MacBook Air great was it was enough computer for most people's needs. And that 12-inch MacBook really wasn't. Um, but I, I also think this goes beyond Intel. I mean, this was where they premiered the the dreadful keyboard that yeah. you know yeah. has been talked about on this show way too much, as listeners remind me. But you know, the, it was just a series of of bad decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the twelve inch MacBook could have been a success even with the Intel processors if they had you know thought about it a little bit further and maybe you know like found a way 
Uh, I'm just going to get into this keyboard again. Oh, yeah, so yeah, I, yeah, I'm not gonna do that. I feel like it could have been a success even with the slower processor, but it did not. It, it never was able to meet that MacBook Air standard of enough processor for yeah. most users. Yeah, uh, and you know we we see this elsewhere. The the MacBook Pro, the the, the Thunderbolt ones, have a tendency to run warm. I think it's uh, clear that maybe Apple was was looking for something that ran a little bit cooler. And that, that does bring us to Intel's process problems. And so again, this is yeah. like CPU architecture engineering stuff. So we're, we're glossing over some stuff because this gets dry and hard to understand pretty quickly. But effectively, over the years, CPUs have moved to smaller process sizes. This means that the CPU itself is smaller, it's more dense, and it allows CPU designs to be more efficient and to run cooler. Yeah, I mean, what what has happened during this period is mobile has become the thing. You know, way more people buy laptops than desktop computers. And making a fast processor, which was all anybody cared about up until about, you know, 20, 2005, uh, now making one that's power efficient is just as, if not more important. That's right. And Intel just hit the wall at 14 nanometers. And they... They were there for a really long time. They're still there, actually, on their desktop processors. And I think looking at the 2016 MacBook Pro, that design that we still have today, you know, our, we each have a 16-inch MacBook Pro. It's still roughly the same form factor. Those machines probably would have been nicer had they been on a smaller process where they could have run cooler and more power efficient. But they, they've been unable to do that. Now, the 10th Gen which is 10 nanometer, they are out in the 13-inch MacBook Pro. The 16-inch MacBook Pro has not gotten it yet. So they are out there. And if you go on the PC side, there's several 10 nanometer 10th gen uh, options out there for you. But this was progress lost. It really was Intel sort of stalling out and what it could do. Now, to make up for some of this, Intel and Apple, because they picked the parts from Intel, uh, they've been adding more cores to its chip. So dual core to quad to six to eight, even beyond in the desktops. This is great for multi-threaded workflows, but it often comes at a cost of slower clock speeds. And so single threaded workflows suffer. And it's, so it's really a stopgap, right? It's really just trying to balance between two kind of bad things. And that's been, a, that was okay for a little while, but in you know, 2015, 2016, 2017, up through now, this has become a bigger problem. It's a bigger weight around Intel's neck. And, and the other problem that really kind of came to light over the last five years is, you know, being dependent on another company for the engine in your cars. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you may have a great new design for your car, but it needs the new engine. And they say, well, we'll have it ready in May. And then May comes along and they say, well, we'll actually have it ready February next year. And you've got all these plans for getting your new car out in May. Yeah. And Apple has been dealing with this. And Apple is partly at fault. I mean, there have been times when Apple, when Intel did processor upgrades that Apple didn't match. Sure. But there have also been a lot of times where if you look at, if you put it on a wall, you know, the Intel promised re release date versus the actual release date. And compare it to Mac releases, you can absolutely see where Apple had some frustration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think that frustration is definitely a real thing. And part of that is Apple's desire for control, right? That they want to make the products they want to make. They want to ship them when they want to ship them. And like you said, having this very critical component, not only not under your control, but in the hands of somebody who is struggling to move the ball forward, that's not where Apple wants to be, right? They don't want to be in that situation. And I think that at the end of the day, Apple feels like they felt in 2003, 4, and 5 running up to the Intel switch that they're stuck, they can't make what they want to make, and that the roadmap for doesn't give them a way out of their current problem. Yeah, and at the exact same time, let's switch over to mobile. Yeah. Over the last five years, yep. the Apple A-series chips just get better, more power efficient, faster every year. And it's been over the last five years that we start seeing benchmarks 
for some of the more powerful A series chips in like the iPad Pro that are matching up against current MacBook Pros on Intel chips. Oh yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And and that's ultimately I think why they're going to switch. It's it's all of this stuff, right? It is the the speed of the processors that they can use on the other side of the aisle. It's that they can have control of that stack. They can build in the features that they want and they're not beholden to anyone else's schedule. And like all that is upside for Apple. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I feel like just like they had Intel Macs running in labs for some time, I suspect that um, they didn't just start making their first Apple Silicon Mac a few months ago. No, I think, I think it's been going on for some time and uh, yeah, we can get into that maybe after this break. This episode of Mac Power Users is brought to you by the IntraZone from Microsoft SharePoint. If you are looking for a new show to listen to, the IntraZone is a bi-weekly podcast with conversation and interviews all about SharePoint, OneDrive, and related tech and how it can work for you. Now, one of the things I love about Mac Power Users is that we get to interview people who do cool things with technology, and that's what the IntraZone is all about. You'll hear from guest experts behind the scenes and out in the field, so you can see how SharePoint fits into everyday work life to easily share and manage content, knowledge, and applications. Each show covers a bunch of cool segments like news and announcements, a focus topic of the week, guest perspectives, FAQs, upcoming events, and more. One episode I really enjoyed was about somebody who was a teacher, and they ended up, because of Microsoft's great technology, being able to build education apps for their classroom, and then becoming an indie developer, building stuff on the Microsoft stack because of these tools that Microsoft offers. It was really a fascinating story that I just love to hear about. So, The Intro Zone, you can find it where you find your podcast. So Apple Podcast, Spotify, Overcast, wherever you look, search for The Intro Zone. That's I-N-T-R-A-Z-O-N-E, or just click the link in the show notes to go check it out. Our thanks to the Intro Zone by Microsoft SharePoint for the support of the show and all of Relay FM. All right. So Apple announced a few months ago that they are transitioning away from Intel and toward Apple Silicon. Now, you said earlier in the show today what a surprise it was when they announced the Intel switch. And I remember being kind of caught flat footed, not realizing that was coming. But I feel like this Apple Silicon transition has been the most rumored transition I've ever heard of a <laughs> Silicon transition. Yeah. Seriously. Uh, yeah, because because the chips have been so good for so long and because Apple is what it is, it just makes sense that they would want to do this. And I mean, you talked about the benchmarks of recent Apple chips and the chips found in MacBook Airs and MacBook Pros. They've caught Intel. And not only have they caught Intel in performance, but the A14 is a five nanometer chip, little itty bitty process. Uh, that's what's coming in the iPad Air and assumedly the new iPhones and maybe an A14X and an iPad Pro and maybe even a Mac. We're still a little ahead of these announcements, but they're just rolling with this stuff. And it all came, I mean, it's amazing. I think that came from the original iPad, right? That was the first device with Apple's own processor, the A4. And now 10 years later, they're in this position to move their all their products to it. It, it is an amazing amount of work and a testament to what they've been able to do in just a decade. Yeah. And I just can't understate how much, you know, the unit of currency now is no longer watt hours. It is, it is uh, hours of battery life. I feel like power consumption is more important than speed. I mean, one of the, we didn't really mention it, but in the last several years, there's not, boy, I'm going to get so much email about this one, but <laughs> I, I feel like there's really not that much of a difference in power between, you know, what consumers buy now, as opposed to five years ago, the whole push has been, how can we extend battery life? And mm -hmm. the comparison between Intel and Apple Silicon is going to be the three and four X kind of, comparisons that you got on watt hours back when they switched to Intel at the beginning. Yeah. I'm very curious to see how that's going to go. I agree with you that a MacBook air today and a MacBook air five years ago, 
basically feel the same. And the the where you really see that is how well older Macs still perform. That if you have an iMac from 2015 or it's still a viable machine today, right? That Macs are viable for the most part until their OS update doesn't support them anymore. And that's that's an incredible statement. That's, that's why the the Mac is such a good purchase because you can run them for years and years. But that does show that uh, how little the needle has moved, at least in the consumer landscape. Yeah, I, I haven't mentioned it on the show, but I am recording today's show on my laptop because in the week since I last recorded Mac Power Users, the iMac, the second iMac we had in the house that we've been using for podcasting, has completely given up the ghost. I forgot that it was 10 years old. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, I didn't realize how old it was because it's just been running forever, right? And it's just never been a problem. And so now Max fail because the hardware degrades over years, not because the software can't keep up. Yeah, yeah that's right. And I am curious to see how the transition goes in terms of performance. I think you're you're right that it's going to be more about battery life, at least at first. I expect that they'll be faster. I'm not saying that, but I think the battery yeah. life is really going to be where they where they talk about the upsides of this because a MacBook Air that you could run for 18 hours would be a, a huge game changer for so many people. Maybe more so when we could travel, but it is it is something that people want, right? People want their devices to last longer. And if you think about 10 hours of life on an iPad, as thin and light as an iPad Pro is, okay, what could a, a newer processor of that style do in the form factor of a MacBook Air or a MacBook Pro? Battery life, it, it has to go up, right? Unless they're going to make everything yeah. as thin as an iPad, which I don't, I don't think they are. It could be a real game changer. Yeah, well, the interesting part about this and the, and the thing that has all of us nerds scratching our heads is I think for the first time, Apple really has its hands on all the dials. I mean, they've got this massive institutional knowledge of how to make these chips and they've been making them a long time. Um, they can choose to say, well, we're going to keep it at the same battery life, but it's going to be substantially more powerful because we have all this extra overhead. It's a smaller chip. We can make it more powerful. Mm -hmm. And they could choose to do that. Maybe with a MacBook Pro, they will. It's not going to have a s significant increase in battery life. But they could also turn the dial the other direction and say, well, we're going to keep it relatively you know, lower in power. But, you know, Like the MacBook Air, powerful enough for most people. But because we're going to save all that overhead on power and performance, we're going to be able to really turn the dial up on battery life because we now have that ability. And I am so eager in the next couple months to see how that story unfolds. Yeah, me too. I think one kind of other open question is, you know, do we see form factor changes? We mentioned that the iMac, the Intel iMac was the same as the G5 iMac, but then you had some Macs that were different. I expect that the iMac is, will get an update, but you know, the Mac mini, the MacBook Air, I think even the MacBook Pro will probably be very similar to what they are now. The question of touch is floating out there, but that's more of a software question than a hardware question, right? Because you have iPad and iPhone apps being able to run on Apple Silicon Macs unmodified, and Big Sur looks very touch friendly. In fact, in fact, we were texting this weekend, and you were putting Catalina back on your MacBook Pro. You're like all everything is so close together. <laughs> you know that really cracked yeah. me up. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, because I because the iMac failed, I had to downgrade this machine to something I could record a podcast on. I had Big Sur on it before, and my menu bar looks like. There's a traffic jam, you know. I mean, everything is just stuck together, and the I just can't get over yeah. how easily I got used to the spacing in Big Sur. I mean, which mm -hmm. is, I mean, obviously it's spaced for fingers in Big Sur. I can't imagine any other explanation of why you would do that. Yeah, I'm right there with you. But again, that's not that is a hardware change, but it's a software question that could come yeah. after the first round of Apple Silicon Max. We just don't know. Um, yeah. And there's questions at the high end, right? Can Apple build uh, an ARM Mac that is faster than my Mac Pro? Uh, the answer, I think, is yes, or they wouldn't be doing this. It may not be on day one. It may be later in the transition. Just because we haven't seen chips from Apple that can match the iMac Pro and the Mac Pro doesn't mean they don't exist, right? Um, I would bundle in this 
Apple's GPU. So the I've heard that the Big Sur beta on the developer transition kits does not include drivers for ARM or from a for AMD graphics. And Apple has said that they're going to be using their own graphics in these Macs. So Apple's got to scale that up too, right? That the, the, the GPU yeah. and the iPad Pro is probably fine for a MacBook Air. Is it fine for a 6K Pro Display XDR? Is it fine for a 5K iMac? We just don't know yet. Again, I think Apple obviously has that answer. They wouldn't be doing this. We just haven't seen that yet. And so those are things I'll be looking for of, yeah, okay, the low end is easy. You know, what are you going to do for me as a professional who currently is on a Mac Pro and uh, will be on a Mac Pro for a long time because I invested all of my money in this computer, it feels like. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, that, that's a question too. And I think that's why this process will take a little while. I think it'll take faster than two years like it did last time. But I think it's going to yeah. follow the same path as last time. They're going to start with the machines that really need attention that can really benefit from it and then move along to machines that are, are more okay. You know, the, the iMac Pro and the Mac Pro, they're fine as Intel Macs, right? They're not suffering under the same things that the notebooks are. So take care of the notebooks first. Yeah, I could see them doing an iMac and maybe a MacBook Air to start. But I could also see them wanting to kind of build this up. Like once you put a bunch of MacBook Airs out in the world, you can learn a lot about it once users start using them. But I guess I'm also making an argument for the MacBook Pro so you don't put it in your most important computer first, which is probably the MacBook Air. Yeah. But the um but either way, I, I could see them doing that and then building up towards the Mac Pro. I'm I'm sure they have plans for the Mac Pro, but maybe they want to see how this all works as they get down that road. And the one thing that stands out for me anytime you hear people at Apple talk about this is they are just dripping with confidence that this is not going to be a problem for them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, part of me is like, well, that's pretty arrogant. You know, I mean, you've never <laughs> done this before. But then again, they have so successfully done these chips for mobile for so long now. And they do have a lot of very smart people that have been making millions of chips that are getting used every day. Yeah. So if you told those people, yeah, can you make one that is bigger and beefier? that is going to be sold in smaller quantities in max, they would just laugh. Of course they can. Yeah. They're, they're on top of their game right now in a huge yeah. way. But it just, you know, it gets to me, it just keeps coming back to those dials. I mean, it's like, do you want a lot of ports? Do you want a lot of battery life? Do you want a lot of, of power? All these things are trade-offs that you have to make. And when you're working with a third party, you have to make it and hope that they can stick to your timeline and that their engineers can, you know, make whatever steps are necessary to turn your ideal chip into a reality. When you're making it yourself, I just feel like they're going to have so much more control. And Apple usually does a pretty good job when they have all the, you know, the, the dials under their fingers. So um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's going to be, as someone who talks about this stuff for a living partly, I think it's going to be fascinating to see mm -hmm. what happens over the next couple of years. And uh, <laughs> on the Mac Power users, we're going to have a lot to talk about. Yeah, it's it's an exciting time. And Apple does such a good job at this. I mean, look at the success of the iPhone and iPad hardware. There have been very few misses over the last 10 years in either one of those product lines. And yeah, it's exciting. I'm excited to talk about it. I'm excited to get my hands on an ARM Mac. Apple Silicon will be coming into the household uh, as soon as it's available. So. Stay yeah, I, am, I don't think I'll be able to resist. I yeah. mean, I, know. I, I hope. <laughs> All right, here's a, here's a fun game. You get to choose. Is the first one a MacBook Air or a 13-inch MacBook Pro? Which which one do you want? I mean, I think I'm going to say the MacBook Air just because it is a little bit lower in the lineup and the MacBook Pro just got updated not too long ago with 10th gen processors. So, but I don't know. The rumors also say that the 13 inch MacBook Pro is up first. So I, I don't know. What do you think? I would think, for the reason I said earlier, that they would start with the MacBook Pro because they don't sell as many of them, you know? And rather than just dive all the way in, start with that machine. Uh, what you don't want is the MacBook Air to get a bad reputation after it's, they're still trying to recover from the whole keyboard fiasco. But, um, 
but I could see them doing both too. I could say, hey, MacBook Air now runs like 20 hours on a charge. And the MacBook Pro is now, you know, about the same battery life, but, you know, twice as fast. Choose your poison. Yep. I think, uh, I think it's going to be fun either way. I'm excited. Yeah, me too. I, I love stuff like this. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I, as I said earlier in the show, it's like, I feel like this has been where Apple has been headed with this stuff for 10 years now. I mean, as soon as they bought, what was the name of that company they bought? Um, the, the Silicon company. Uh, PA uh, Semiconductor. PA Semiconductor. It, it, like as soon as they bought that, they got on this road. And it wasn't inevitable that they would get here, but the last few years, it's, it sure seems inevitable. Sure does. Yeah. All right. Well, Apple, this is a big one. We are excited. We're so excited we gave you a whole show. Don't let us down. They've done transitions before. This will be, I guess, what will be the third, I guess, major chip transition. And uh, I feel like they know what they're doing. Now just give us our new Macs. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, all in all, so, so to wrap this up, we said we were going to grade the Intel era. What grade would you give it? You know what? I'm going to give it an A. I mean, it. you know, the rom-com did come to an end, and it needed it. But, I mean, the switch to Intel was super important, and it's what allowed the Mac to become what it is today. And, you know, when you think about the the stuff during the montage song, it was pretty amazing. I, I agree with you. Even though the last few years have been tough, I think that not only did we get some amazing Intel Max, it coincided with a huge growth in the Mac as a product out in the world, right? Things yeah. like the MacBook and the MacBook Pro and the MacBook Air becoming default computers for all sorts of types of people. That happened at least in part because of the Intel transition. So yeah, I was the right move and I, I agree with you. I give it an A, uh, but I'm excited to see it come to an end. Yeah. I remember before the Intel transition, I'd be using an Apple laptop and people in airports would walk up to me and want to become my friend because they also had an Apple laptop and we were the only two people in the airport that had an Apple laptop, you know, stuff like that used to happen, <laughs> you know, not anymore. Mm-mm. All right. Well, guys, we're all excited about it. Uh, If you've got particular wishes and desires or ideal dial knob turnings that you think Apple should be doing, sound off about it in the forums. You can find them over at talk.macpowerusers.com. Thanks for indulging us in this little trip through history. Uh, Thanks to Steven, who did the massive amount of work that it took to to get all this data together for today's show. And um, we're going to have some great show notes for this one. You can find us over at relay.fm slash MPU. Uh, thank you to our sponsors, 1Password, Smile, Hover, and Microsoft. And we will see you next week.